I'm sure I'll be able to defeat the champion. No, I will defeat the champion. I'll be the judge of that beat. Can Bede actually become champion of the Gala region? Considering he literally got cancelled by Chairman Rose halfway through, maybe not. But let's not jump to conclusions, eh? From my last two runs of the game, I quickly came to realize that both Hop and Marty would fall short of the challenge. So might as well see how the third and final rival would do. In order to figure out what really happens as BD goes through Galar, I went through the game using his team as best as I could. This means no hold items, no extra moves, and only one use of the best potion available per battle. So where does his journey start? From his league card, we learned that Beat lived in an orphanage for quite a while. Apparently, Rose had visited the orphanage and given our great-haired rival his first Pokemon, Hatina, which I'll name Melia since she gives off the same energy as Fesco from Xenoblade Chronicles. It's most likely that Oleana saw promise in him and convinced Rose to send him off to the Galar Gym Challenge with the goal of collecting wishing stars along the way and perhaps becoming the champion for spoiler reasons. I say Oleana because Rose obviously forgets who poor Travis even is when we see him in Hobury. As you may be aware, the easiest way to actually gather wishing stars is to do raid battles, collect watts, and then buy them from the sellers in the wild area. But after trying a bunch of raids, Betis probably got sick of the incompetent trainers who joined the raid and figured he's better off collecting random fragments from other trainers and routes. Before going off to face the gym, he probably pulled a Marnie and caught both sword and shield exclusives from this one raid deck, Solaces and Gothita. From there, he collected all the wishing stars he could in Galar Mind 1 and went on to take Milo. If he really rushed straight to the gym though, he would have been too underleveled to win. So chances are, Travis actually went out of his way to beat up all the Eevee children and that one guy who's been breeding Pokemon for 50 years in order to level up a bit and get himself the grass badge. I want to point out that I didn't have to do that for the other two rivals. They were just naturally high enough level. Not beady though. From there, he must have hustled over to Halbury to deliver the wishing stars he's collected so far and claim a reward from Oleana. I say reward from Oleana because he suddenly has a Ponyta on his team that isn't available until after the fourth gym. As well as Rock Tomb, a TM that you can only get in Sword after defeating Gordy, or apparently in Shield from that one random couple right above the Pokemon Center in Surchester. Some strings are definitely getting pulled here, including Bead conveniently avoiding any battles with Team Yell, who may or may not have nearly softlocked me out of continuing this run while trying to steal a bike. I digress. I figured since Mr. BD was running off into the next mine that maybe, just maybe, he had already gotten the second badge as well, but uh, <laughs> I am once again stuck at Neza. Did you know that she's secretly also a dark type gym leader? Me neither! Her Aracuda used Bite and Bite only unless I was nearly dead, and her Dreadnought didn't even bother setting up rain this time around. Just max darkness after max darkness after max freaking darkness! So I went back to beat up all the trainers I skipped on the previous route since that worked for Milo's gym. Except even that wasn't enough to defeat Nessa. Meaning that just like Hop, Bead would have lost at this gym. Nessa over here putting Kabu to shame. First real roadblock? You wish old man. Makes me wonder if Oleana bought the badge for Beetroot Boy as a thanks for collecting all the wishing stars, or he got super lucky with all crit hits, or just used his brain and taught Melia magical leaf so that she can finally beat up Dredna. <laughs> I was, I was very much stuck on this gym for a very long time, guys. Next up was Kabu, who I instantly regretted trash talking a few moments ago. His Santa Scorch is part bug type and could easily one shot everything on my team. So even if Bidet somehow managed to defeat Nessa, there's no way he would have gone past Kabu as well. Yet somehow he did and is still smug enough after both of them to pick a fight with the main player and Hop. Good thing this is Pokemon, and being overleveled enough means you can win any story fight. Now let's see how the rest of the game would go. In the Hop video, I learned that Hop very much stands a chance against Bidi. Now we get to see it from Bede's perspective, and by that I mean we get to see Solos' nearly solo wing Hop's entire team. After getting the clout from defeating the champions of the younger brother, Bede reports to Rose and Oleana in Hammerlock, where she seems to have something to discuss. Hmm, I wonder if it has anything to do with the two gym badges she might have bought for him. <laughs> Good thing she wouldn't have to buy the fourth gym badge since Travis's team actually stands a chance against Alistair. But winning isn't enough for this guy, no no no. He has to go and borrow the chairman's starter Pokemon and use it to destroy an ancient mural because there's more wishing stars there or something? Am I the only one who was very confused by this plot point? Did Oleana set him up? Did he stand in the way of a simple beam? I guess this is where our psychic type rival gets cancelled. 
Except for some reason, he still wants to help out the chairman. Who writes these characters? Lucky for him, Opal finds him pink enough for the pink club. She even calls out Oleana for pulling the strings and promises some answers that we never get to hear. You know what this means? Training time. Since we can't know for sure what Opal did to train him, I'm just gonna use my imagination and the DLC that I spent quite a lot of money on that she sends him off to train at the Isle of Armor with the ex-champion and a new fairy type Pokemon. A while. There, Bede captures a routes as well in the foggy field of honor and definitely not an overcast rolling fields, then faces off against his psychic counterpart, Avery, and is able to beat him time and again thanks to his fairy type moves. Having overcome someone who's just as pretentious as himself, Bede's next challenge is to learn the power of love. And by that I mean the power of showing scenery to this funky looking karate bear. Ooh, ah, okay that's enough. Before completing his training with Mustard, Bidet must overcome one last challenge, the Tower of Darkness, with his one and only Nod Kupfu. Basically I just used Melee and spam Dazzling Gleam for 3 hours straight. For the final stretch of the fairy type training, Travis probably had to beat Opal in a gym battle, which he did with Mawile, alone, and didn't even bother Dynamaxing. As her final reward for all the hard work, Opal rewards Bede a TM for Mystical Fire, which gives him the ability to counter his steel types. Since this training must have taken a lot longer than it took me, this is probably the point at which Betis would have gone straight to Wyndon to interrupt the final so that he could, uh, show his will isn't broken or something. Can, can someone please explain to me this character's reasons for doing half the things he does? I was a smidge curious how he would have done against the last three gyms had he stayed a psychic type trainer, and since I didn't have the luxury of actually skipping them, I figured I'd use his old team and keep Gardevoir as the hypothetical reward from Oilana had things gone differently on Stoan's side. Out of the three, the Sir Chester gym posed the highest challenge, but since my team knew both fairy and fire type moves, that made the fights against Pierce and Ryan extremely easy. Also, my team had fully evolved by the last two, making things even easier. And to top it off, Runiclus conveniently learns a fighting type move when it evolves. Overall, the last three gyms wouldn't have been much of a challenge for Betty. Now we're at the interesting part. Can Berto do what Hop and Marnie couldn't? I hope so, since his team had an extremely easy time defeating both rivals in the semifinals. Let's pretend that hypothetically, we won the fight against the protagonist and were allowed to participate in the finals. First up, we would have to fight Nessa, who once again has completely lost her bite in the late game. Next up we have Alistair, who I could easily defeat, just like the first time. W wait a second. Next up was Alistair, who I could easily defeat after using Max Protect twice in a row because Gengar is actually a pretty good Pokemon with high speed and special attacks that Melia couldn't survive against while G-Maxed. So um, maybe we lose here, but if this was Sword, Beto would have been able to win against B and move on to the last match. Which was once again super easy given that we have fairy types and they're strong against dragons. Alright, time to fight Lee, oh no. Feeling guilty and used by Rose, Berto goes to help Leon and settle the score with the chairman, for whom he no longer cares about. Oh, you're actually approaching me? I can't beat the shinks out of you without getting closer. Ho ho, then come as close as you like. This dude starts setting up a sword dance on me, so it's time to pull out Melia and do like she did in Xenoblade. Throw fire in the face of every enemy that no one else dares to attack. In the end, she couldn't defeat the giant metal elephant, but Rapidash could pull in the last second victory. Meaning that we get to make Opal proud and catch Eternatus in the pinkest ball we could find. And finally, we get to fight Leon, who uses Aegislash to slash through my fairy type team like... Like a hot knife through butter! Yeah, exactly. And, and then his Dragapult outspeeds everything else and has an upper hand since they're also psychic types and weak against ghost attacks. Well... Looks like Beta can't win against Leon, making this guy a truly undefeatable champion. Wait a minute! It looks like my team is more than mildly underleveled. And I've only got 4 Pokemon on my team instead of 5 like everyone else. Maybe during the 3 day break between beating up Rose and fighting Leon, Bid would've gone back to the Isle of Armor to train up for the final fight. 
And by that, I mean to beat up a bunch of Chansey so that his team would have been approximately the same level, and also give an Eevee all the love of playing catch and cooking curry to acquire a Sylveon, a literal Dragon Slayer. Who's scary now, Dragapult? Alright, time to fight Leon. For real this time. Mawao goes right for the fake tears, which completely ignores his king shield. I knew she couldn't do much damage against Aegislash, but if its special defense was low enough, whatever came out next could at least one-shot it. I even got to land a crunch, which managed to lower its HP quite a bit. Rapidash came in hot with Dazzling Gleam. This time it was able to survive one hit from Haxorus's Iron Tail and take it down. Dragapult tried to be scary, but since we finally have a pure fairy type, its attacks do nothing to us. I've kinda wasted a turn against Cinderace since I completely forgot that fire types are randomly resistant to fairy attacks, Gardevoir finished it off with Psychic. And since this is the post-game team, we conveniently knew Energy Ball which would one-shot Seismitoad, leaving us with Melia versus Charizard. I played it safe and used Max Guard the first turn just in case it knew a dark type move. You think I know this thing's moveset by now, but uh, nope. I figured I'd take my chances and hit it with a Max Mindstorm. And then it got small. And I realized, out of all the rivals in the game, Bede is actually able to beat Leon. Had Rose and the protagonist not stopped Beedy in his tracks, this mad lad would have actually become the champion. I guess it goes to show that you gotta be a bit more patient, Chairman Rose. Then maybe, just maybe, your plans could have worked out. Seeing that none of the three rivals could have actually become champion of the Gala region, I'm still kind of curious how some other trainers would have done. I think I'd like to try this out with Ryan, Pierce, and also Nessa since she's been giving me so much trouble. I've really been deliberating on doing a Leon run as well, but I'm not too sure which team to go for. So I guess if you're interested in seeing a Galar challenge from Leon's perspective, let me know in the comments below which of the three starters do you think would best suit him, and I'll go from there. The next one of these videos might take a little while to make though since my fall semester just started and I won't have as much time to record. But I've been enjoying making these, so uh, yeah, it'll be out eventually. Until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the comments.